Deploying web apps is really easy. You jump into AWS, spin up an EC2 instance, pick a Linux distro, install Java, Node and any other dependencies, configure your database, set up Nginx, open the right ports, and then do it all again for staging and production. And then again for every new service. So, while things might seem easy on the surface, manually setting up infrastructure doesn't work at scale. This is when containerization tools like Docker come into play. Instead of setting up each machine by hand, you define everything your app needs in a Docker file. This file captures every dependency from the OS to the application code to build steps or runtime configurations. Then, using the docker build command, we can turn this file into a versioned and reproducible artifact called a docker image. Most of us use docker for simple tasks like running apps locally without worrying about dependencies. But the real power comes from turning your entire app into a portable, versioned unit that can run the same way everywhere. Under the hood, Docker wraps Linux kernel features like control groups and namespaces, which are responsible for process isolation and resource management. Namespaces make sure each container has its own view of the system, so it looks like it's running on its own little server. Control groups, on the other hand, let Docker limit how much CPU or memory each container can use, preventing one container from hogging all the resources and bringing down the entire machine. As a quick side note, containerization tools like Docker or Podman are a lightweight alternative to full-blown virtual machines. Instead of emulating an entire operating system, they isolate processes at the kernel level. In other words, you get the isolation benefits of virtual machines without the overhead of booting up an entire OS for each service. Tools like Docker are much faster to start, easier to scale, and far less resource-hungry, so you can run dozens of containers on a single machine without the overhead of managing multiple guest OS instances. It's important to know that Docker relies on two main concepts, images and containers. An image is like a blueprint that defines everything your app needs to run, including the actual application code. Once built, that image doesn't change. It's a versioned, shareable, and portable bundle of your app and its surrounding environment. A container, on the other hand, is a running instance of that image. Think of it as the live execution of your app, isolated from the rest of the system, but lightweight enough to start in seconds. To reiterate, you start by defining all your dependencies and build instructions in a Docker file, use the file to create a Docker image with the build command, and then put that image on any machine running Docker and start a container with the run command. But once your app grows past a certain point, Docker alone isn't enough. You start with one container for your backend, one for your database, and another for your frontend. Then you realize you need caching, a metrics collector, and a few more internal services. Suddenly, you are running 10 containers and trying to glue them all together manually, so it feels like you are back to square one. This is where orchestration becomes essential. You need something to manage all those containers, keep them running, restart them when they crash, route traffic between them, and scale them based on load. Tools like Kubernetes build on top of Docker and let you treat infrastructure as code. You declare how many replicas your app needs, what ports it exposes, and how it connects to other services. Then, the orchestrator makes it happen. If a node goes down, containers are rescheduled elsewhere. If you push a new version, you can roll it out gradually. If traffic spikes, you can scale up. Under the hood, orchestrators use a control plane to constantly monitor the state of your system and reconcile it with the desired state you've defined in YAML manifests. This includes deployments for managing replicas and rolling updates, services for exposing and load balancing traffic between pods, config maps and secrets for handling environment variables and credentials, and persistent volumes for managing data that needs to survive restarts. Pods are the smallest deployable units and they wrap around one or more containers. Each node in the cluster runs an agent called the kubelet, which ensures that containers are running as specified by the control plane. The scheduler decides where new pods should run, based on available CPU, memory, and any node constraints. To expose services to the outside world, you typically use an ingress, which handles external traffic routing. Everything communicates through the API server, which acts as the central hub of the Kubernetes control plane. In all fairness, this is not trivial to set up, but once in place, it gives you a highly automated self-healing system that can run complex, multi-service applications without falling apart when something breaks. But if this seems overwhelming, you could avoid all this mess, defer all backend and DevOps work to a backend as a service platform like Superbase, and pass the responsibility of data breaches and security incidents to professionals who actually know how to leak entire databases at once. Or you could use today's sponsor. 
Sevala is an all-in-one, no-friction platform as a service for deploying anything ranging from interactive apps to databases or static sites, offering cloud-native performance and a seamless dev experience with advanced deployment pipelines, instant preview for apps or static websites, and one-click deploy templates to accelerate your development process. Under the hood, Sevala is leveraging Google Kubernetes Engine across 25 regions, and thanks to Cloudflare's Edge Network integration, your static content is globally optimized for speed. Check out the link in the description and you can get started for free with a $50 credit, no hidden fees and predictable payments.